Today we're going to be reading from the book of Revelation, one of Jesus' messages to the seven churches of Revelation. This is the last message that he gave of those seven. And we're going to focus on the theme, Jesus is knocking. And knocking can come in more than one form. If you hear this, open up, this is the FBI. Well, that's one kind of knocking. You know, if, if you hear the police banging on the door, that sets off a certain reaction and they're there for a reason. If you hear, and it's your friend saying they're here and they'd like to visit with you, that's also a kind of knocking. And this letter involves both kinds of knocking. You had better wake up, I'm at the door. And I really would like to come in and have supper with you. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot, I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. There was an old English minister one day in a church with one of the high pulpits who marched up the steps to the pulpit, and it took him a while, and he went up one step, and then another step, and then another, and he got to the top of the pulpit after going up those 15 steps to the top, and he gave his sermon. What does it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his soul? And he turned around and walked down the 15 steps, and that was the end of his sermon. Sometimes... You need to get people's attention. They're there expecting a bit more of the same old, same old, and they've gotten used to feeling comfortable and kind of complacent. And then sometimes a shock is needed, the kind of shock that says this is the police. Or this is the knocking that is going to disrupt your comfort zone. And when Jesus knocks on the door of Laodicea and its church, he has some very shocking, very startling words for them. This is, among the seven churches, the toughest message of them all. Jesus speaks to them, and he has really nothing good to say about them at this point. And in a sense, that's kind of surprising, because if you were to read his letters to the other churches, you find that he has uh, some of the churches, three of them, that he has kind of a mixed message for. He'll say, yeah, here's what's good, and now here's what you guys need to straighten out. And he'll say things, for example, like, you're, you're good on the teaching, but you're letting a lot of immorality slide by. Or... I know you're being brave in the face of persecution, but you're putting up with this wicked woman among you. So he'll give them kind of a mixed teaching. And then there are two churches that he has nothing bad to say about. 
And those are the two churches which, if our church experts had been assessing, probably would have said were the weakest churches. They were the churches that were kind of beaten down, the ones that had really been facing hard times and persecution. And Jesus told the church in Smyrna and in Philadelphia, you guys are doing great. And then he, the two churches really that he has the hardest messages for were the ones that appeared to be doing the best. There's the church in Sardis, which had a great name, a great reputation, and they were the happening place. And they seemed to have it all, at least in the opinion of people around them. Jesus said, you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what little remains. So the, the church that has the reputation and that other people think is this fabulous church, Jesus is not impressed by. And then we come to Laodicea. We don't know what others thought of them. We know what they thought of them. They thought they were great. They thought that they were in the bloom of excellent health. And the scary thing about this church is that Jesus doesn't say any of the negative things about them that he says about some of the other churches. He does not criticize their doctrine. He doesn't say, well, you, you've been suckers for false teaching. He doesn't criticize their morals either. Maybe there was a lot to criticize, I don't know, but he doesn't criticize their doctrine or their morals. There's something um, similar in that respect to another church where he complimented their doctrine and their morals. When he was talking to the church in Ephesus, he says, I like the way your doctrine is strong. I like the way you're holding out morally. Um, I like the way you're standing up to persecution. I just have one thing against you. You lost your first love. And that was a devastating loss. And when you look at Laodicea, it, it's a little bit similar, only he doesn't compliment them on any of the other things. He just says, I just have one thing to say about you. You are lukewarm. And he says that in context, that probably would have hit that church a little bit harder even because Jesus knew the setting of that church very well. And there were a number of things that stood out about the city of Laodicea. Laodicea was a very wealthy city famed for its banking and for its commerce. It was famous also for its medical center and for the eye salve that was produced there as a remedy for eye problems. It was a place that was big in textile manufacturing and famous for its wool products, for its clothing. And it was noted for bad water. There were two major cities nearby. One was famous for its warm mineral springs and the health-giving properties of those mineral springs. Another was famous for its wonderful cold springs of water and for the refreshment that people could get from there. And well, Laodicea got its water, you know, piped in through an aqueduct. And by the time it got to town, it was room temperature. And well, how many of you like iced tea? Some of you maybe like hot tea. How many of you love room temperature tea? You know, room temperature is not what most of us are after in tea or in water. And when it came to Jesus' assessment of Laodicea, he says, I wish you were hot. And, you know, they might have thought of that, those hot mineral springs or, or cold or those wonderful cool springs to drink from. But you're too much like the water that gets piped into town and is room temperature and brackish and tastes kind of bad. You make me feel like puking. This is not the most polite thing Jesus could say to a church that has a high opinion of itself. You think you're great, you make me want to puke. And again, let me remind you, he's not criticizing directly their morals or their doctrine. He's saying the one thing wrong with them that is so terribly wrong is that they've become kind of room temperature. They no longer have 
the energy, the joy, the zeal, the excitement of belonging to the Lord Jesus Christ, they're just kind of meh, and they think they're doing well. And financially, they're doing well, and in other respects, maybe they're doing well, but not in the opinion of the Lord Jesus Christ, and not in their relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it is so very important when, when we make a profession of faith and we see people make that commitment to the Lord that we again reflect on our own commitment. It's important as a church, as a whole, to say, now where are we at? And we, we need to reflect on that in the light, not just of what we think of ourselves, but what Jesus thinks of the church. And be willing to hear some uncomfortable truths as a church as well as as individuals. A church can start out with a lot of excitement. It can be thrilled with the Lord Jesus, with what he's doing in our midst, and have a sense of vision. And after a while, we kind of settle in to room temperature. And nobody's preaching any great heresies. Nobody is launching huge scandals that affect the whole congregation. And the budget's doing pretty well. And hey, we're fine. Well, maybe not. We always have to reflect on what Jesus thinks of the church. And as individuals, we have to also think about that deadly characteristic of lukewarmness. It can happen if you're a young person. You grow up in the church and you kind of assume that, hey, dad and mom are Christians, I, I'm a Christian, and, uh, you know, this, is, this, this churchianity is what Christianity is, and, and nothing to get too excited about, nothing to get too worried about, and here we are. And that kind of attitude can be especially dangerous if you grew up in the church. You, you know the old saying, um, being in a garage doesn't make you a car. Um, being in a church doesn't necessarily make you a devoted, on-fire follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's, that's an important reminder for kids or for teens and young people who grow up in a church and to realize that Jesus did not come into the world and pour out his life and shed his precious blood and give his Holy Spirit so that we could go around at room temperature. And that's an important reminder, not just for younger people who grew up in a congregation, but it's very important for the, those of us who are about my age. You know, we're in our middle years, and sometimes people think, boy, the, the, the youth, we really got to get to those youth because, you know, they can fall into this sin, and they can get into that kind of predicament. And boy, the young people, oh, if they can just make it through those years of youth, and get to adulthood and have their head on straight, then it's clear sailing from there. Oh, no, it's not. Maybe you get set in a certain way so that the big immoralities aren't as big a temptation as they once were. Or where you're not at that stage of life where you're still searching quite as much, and so you might not be as likely to fall for some crazy heresy or false ideas about God. But one of the great besetting problems of my age is lukewarmness, of cynicism, of just plodding along from week to week and getting by. And the first love is gone. The heat and zeal and joy and energy and excitement has sunk to a very low ebb. And so it is very important when we hear Jesus' words addressed to the lukewarm that we don't say, boy, you know, I hope the young people are listening. Or, boy, I hope thus and such person is listening. And I think that'd be a good message for one of those dead churches I know about somewhere. Well, um, it might be real advisable for each of us to simply hear the words of Jesus, to hear his startling knock, and realize that you don't have to be a spectacular sinner or a crazy-minded heretic to get on the wrong side of Jesus and make him sick. You can 
Just go the lukewarm route, and that will do the job. And so Jesus warns them, because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth, or vomit. And we therefore need to realize how offensive lukewarmness is to the Lord Jesus, and um, realize, again, how important it is to take our own spiritual temperature in the light of Jesus' words. And he's speaking to these people in Laodicea, and they, they've got something else in common with us. They lived in a rich setting. They had good medicine. They had good banks and finances. They produced the best of clothing. And when you're well-clothed, when you're well-financed, when the bank accounts and the stocks and bonds are about where you were hoping they'd be, and when you're in excellent health with medical care all available, then you get into dangerous territory. Those things are all blessings. And yet they're dangerous. Jesus said, it's pretty hard for a rich man to make it. It's harder, it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to make it into the kingdom of God. And why is that? Well, because with affluence often comes a sense of complacency, a loss of dependence on God, a loss of desire for the kingdom of God to come because we've already got it pretty good. And we don't want it to change too much because we're among the ones who are doing well as things are going. And in Laodicea, you're in the big banking center and you're part of that church and you say, I'm rich, what do I need? Um, and Jesus says, you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. They think they're rich, they're poor. They think they've got their great eye salve and their wonderful vision. And Jesus says, you're blind. You, you can't see your own condition you can't see me as I am. And they're naked. They've got all the textiles being produced in that city. And spiritually, they're naked. So Jesus wants to make two major points to them. You need what I have. That's his rebuke. You need what I have and you don't know it. And the other thing is not just his rebuke, but then his promise. And I have what you need. And I am very happy, in fact, delighted to give it. So I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, real riches, and then you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. When people are blind to their own condition, blind to the glory and wonder of the Lord Jesus Christ, and have just slumped into this lukewarmness of being self-satisfied, Jesus says, I will give you vision to see me, to see yourself. Jesus says to people who think they're about good enough the way they are, I'll give you robes of righteousness that will really make you able to stand in God's presence. To those who may be satisfied with their bank accounts and think, yeah, their accounts with God must be okay too, Jesus says, well, I'll make you really rich. I'll give you treasure in heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ then goes on to say, what his real motivation is for all this shocking talk. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. He has not been talking very nice. Um, you know, you make me want to puke is not a great conversation starter. But Jesus says, you know, you've got to understand that those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest, or other translations maybe are even a little more accurate. Be zealous and repent. Get serious. Get fired up. Repent. Turn around. I'm telling you this because I love you. And then he goes on to say, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. When Jesus talks, it's so much different than the way we tend to think of religion. We're a lot worse than we think we are. And things could be so much greater than we know they could be. We will settle for lukewarmness and it makes Jesus sick and we don't realize how serious a thing that is. And we don't realize the fact that he doesn't just want us to clean up a little bit and behave a little better and believe a little more correctly. He wants fellowship with us. And the trouble 
with lukewarm people, and therefore the solution for lukewarm people is not a little more of this or a little more of that or trying a little harder. It's that we lost contact with the living Christ. It's that the life and energy and joy of the Lord is no longer our strength, if it ever was. And when you get close to Jesus, when you're in communion with Him, when He's living in your heart, when He's transforming your life, then the fire comes again. Because Christ lives in you by His Holy Spirit. Christianity is Christ. Christ in you. Christ dwelling in you. Christ dwelling in your heart by faith. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. These are the kinds of ways the Bible talks about what it is to be a Christian. And this verse was very important in my own life. When I was nine years old, I struggled and had a lot of questions and, and fears about where I stood with the Lord. And it was to this verse that my mom directed me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. And it was then that I welcomed and was glad to have the Lord Jesus Christ come into my life and into my heart. It was then that I, that I had a dream of heaven and a tremendous joy and assurance of belonging to the Lord Jesus Christ. But as I've said, it's still pretty easy for a person like me over the years to... And that, that, you think, oh, that might not be so easy for preachers. Oh, yes, it is. Um, you know what? Sometimes it's even worse for preachers because we preachers deal not only with our own spiritual problems, but we get to deal with a few others as well. And, you know, after a while, you can start focusing on what's going on here or there, and you can lose focus on what it's really all about. Fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ in me, the hope of glory. And that's the only cure for lukewarmness, is to have that communion with Jesus reestablished. To have the living Christ, the presence of His Holy Spirit, kindled us because we can quench the Spirit. We can grieve the Spirit. And we need to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So I, I just call you again today to hear that knock, knock, knock. Uh, that the judge is at the door because Jesus can come and with these churches in Revelation he didn't have to come with all his angels to judge the whole world to take away their particular lampstand and to remove those churches um, from blessing and from his presence. His judgment and his coming can come to a church a lot sooner than that and come to an individual a lot sooner than the end of the world. So when Jesus says, here I am, I'm knocking his ultimate second coming may be very near, but his coming to you or to me may be a lot sooner than the overall second coming. And so each of us, and we as a congregation, must always stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and hear his knocking. As an individual, then, I want you to hear the voice of Jesus. And if you've belonged to him for a long time and you have the temptation that I do to kind of get into a room temperature religion after a while, or as he charged another church with, to, to lose your first love. The only way to renew it is to get close to him again and to welcome him again. There, there's a sense, yeah, I don't turn this into a theological system, but there's a sense in which we do need to be saved over and over and over again. Even though his salvation is great, even though when he has his hand upon you, he'll never let you go. Yet there are times when your faith, you, you, you hardly believe anymore. You just feel so far from God and you need Jesus to knock and just take over again. And for some, of course, if that door was never opened in the first place, then there is no substitute than putting your faith, your personal faith in Jesus Christ right now, putting him on the throne of your life. And as I said, it's not only that Jesus talks to us a lot more directly and bluntly and even harshly than we might like and reveals to us that we're a lot worse than we might think, but he also comes and, and makes these promises that sound almost ridiculous 
in their wonder you know, if we've sunk into lukewarmness. Yeah, you know, we, we can't expect too much. Uh, an actual communion with Jesus, an actual interaction and blessing of his love and, and nearness and presence in my life and fellowshipping with me, that, that sounds like quite a bit. Well, you have, ain't heard nothing yet. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I sat down with my father on his throne. You know, we're kind of thinking about getting by, hoping that, you know, we're not doing anything too crazy that God would get ticked off about. And he's planning on fellowship and thrones. That's why you can't get lukewarm, because he's got a lot bigger things than just getting by and surviving and coping and making it. Or he wants fellowship forever, and he's got a throne prepared. Really, those no, there's no middle ground. It's either fellowship and thrones or puking. Okay? The, we're always looking for some little compromise, neutral middle ground. And Jesus wants to make of you something fabulous beyond what you can imagine. And he doesn't have a plan B to make you kind of the mediocre little thingamabob that you think you could be. <laughs> He's got something a lot better than that. And so hear his voice again. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. And to him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, he or she who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We pray, Father, that you will indeed open our ears to the voice of Jesus and our hearts to the presence of his spirit. We thank you, Lord, for the wonders of what you promise and help us never to settle for anything less. Where, Lord, we've grown lukewarm, we pray again that you will fire us with the light and fire of your presence and that we may know you better and love you more, you, the faithful and true witness. Oh, how our witness is compromised when we become lukewarm. And so we need you, the true and faithful witness, to again live and, and breathe among us and make us strong as individuals. Revive us too, Lord, as a church. Help us never to become self-satisfied or complacent, but more and more, Lord, to delight in you and have you delight in us. Help us, Lord, to see again the splendor of what you promise, that you will indeed cause us to reign with you. Help us to be faithful in this life, that we may have true treasure in the life to come. And Lord, as we again have participated in the joyful occasion of a profession of faith, help us again, Lord, to be roused to new devotion and new commitment by the reality of who you are and what it means to belong to you by faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.